Okay, we are recording. So I'll hand the floor over to Pipette Group number seven. All right, here we go. So uh, before we get started, just want to say thanks again for uh, Dr. Trom, our sponsors, saw Noel in there, our TA, who's been with us every step of the way for uh, taking time out of their day uh, to go and go through this presentation with us. Uh, it really means a lot to uh, show off what we've been working on all semester. Um, so with that being said, we are the micro droppers or pipe at seven. Our group consists of Drew, myself, Joseph, Christopher, Paul, and Michael. Um, a little bit of background and introduction. Um, as described in our customer needs statement, uh, we need to, we are tasked with uh, dis uh, dispensing 10 to 200 microliters with a one microliter precision. Um, this was validated during our testing week and precision was also done during our demo week. Um, since this is a modular design in the entire bioreactor, it's important to reduce the bill of materials cost since many uh, parts pile up and our part cost cannot exceed 100 and we were just under that at $96.07. Uh, and since this is being assembled in shop, uh, the manual assembly time was asked to be less than five minutes. And two of our group members can put together our product in three minutes and 34 seconds. Um, since uh, this microbioreactor is asked to operate for up to two weeks at a time with no human intervention, uh, we placed a limit switch at the bottom of our design to incorporate that fail safe that was asked. Uh, noting on the uh, modularity of the microbioreactor again. It was asked to be in that certain uh, volume envelope, which our design does. And lastly, since this will be in the lab setting, uh, this uh, we incorporated non-reactive metals and plastic in our design. So our um, our group decided to take a different um, idea at the beginning of the semester. We broke up into two mini teams. We actually had two groups of three who came up with two designs. Uh, we kind of put those designs head to head and selected the winner. Uh, the one on the left, which is the one I was a part of, was the all-in-one design. We tried to do a slender design, uh, reducing the part costs. One of the issues we came in, uh, we came to discover was the offset of the motor, and which had the plunger and ejector in the center. We, for, uh, we went on to change that in our final design. But as you can see in the orange picture, the top right one, which is the uh, see, sort of the all-in-one piece, uh, we tried to incorporate a lead nut, a ejector, and a plunger all in one piece to try to simplify parts. Uh, came to discover that that was not the best way to go about things, and that but that was one of our initial designs at the beginning of the semester. The killer team design was different from the all-in-one design in that the lead screw did not have an offset from the um, the nozzle and the plunger. Um, this was accomplished by inverting the motor placement so that the lead screw of the motor was pointing upwards instead of downwards. This lead screw was then connected into the inner frame of the guillotine design um, with a heat insert, or it was designed with a heat insert, um, and the inner frame moved upwards and downwards um, by translating the rotational motion into linear motion um, by fitting inside guide rails of the outer frame. This design never had a working prototype because it was nixed before we got um, to a stage where it was able to completely work, um, but we still took design features from this into um, the future all-in-one design. We tried incorporating a low number of parts and some of the design features we took forward were the guide rails that helped translate the motion um, we took the offset forward and we also used heat inserts in the final design. So pictured here is the final design for the housing and motor mount. And some of the key features we have starting at the upper left hand corner and working our way counterclockwise. We have four holes which were for the motor. Uh, these were the motor fasteners. This was just to safely secure the motor to the motor mount without it falling off during uh, testing. And underneath that, we have four internal wire channels. These were located at each corner of the top of the motor mount. And this was to make sure that the wires were out of the way from any moving mechanisms internally. And this connected the limit switch to the motor and the tool changer. And we also have two guide rail systems, one on each side of the motor mount wall. 
And this was to help turn the rotational motion into linear motion during testing. Underneath that, we have two limit switch holes. And this was to fasten the limit switch to the motor mount housing. This, um, this height was chosen because this is where the plunger was fully able to dispense uh, liquid without ejecting the tip. And at the, at the base of the motor mount, we have four housing fasteners each at each corner. And this was to safely secure the housing to the motor mount. And we also use threaded heat inserts for that. We also created a triangular slot for the tool changer. And this was just to easily change out the pipette design from the bioreactor. And we also added a mini housing wall on the side of the housing. And this was to protect the motor and other electrical components from any testing fluids. I think we're having some trouble with Drew, Andrew. I think, I think he, Drew's uh, Wi-Fi went out. Let me see if one of us could maybe bring up the PowerPoint while he's disconnected. Uh, I can bring it up. Yeah, Chris, if you could, that would probably be helpful. Okay. Oh, it looks like Andrew's back. I, yep. <laughs> uh, I'll pull it back up right now. I'm sorry about that. Technology strikes again. Gotta love it. <laughs> it wouldn't be group seven without a little bit of chaos. Yeah. All right. Hold on. Let me share sound. Things are going a little too well. <laughs> all right. We all good? Yep. Yep. All right. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> all right. Here we go. Okay. I finished my slide. Drew. All right, so uh, now that we're all back here, you can see a nice perspective of the pipette with the outer casing removed, providing a nice view of the motion assistance subsystem. This subsystem directly relates to the motor mount you saw before, so much of what you'll hear will be directly related to that. As required by the customer needs, we utilized a NEMA 17 stepper motor and lead screw combination for all motion within the pipette. The NEMA 17 motor came with a small brass lead nut as seen on the left we were able to convert the rotational motion of the motor into linear motion utilizing this lead nut. Additionally, we designed an extended lead nut with guide rails dubbed the spaceship. Because the spaceship was 3D printed, it, was, it did not have threads natively inside of it, so we fastened it to the brass lead nut. The spaceship was inserted into the guides on the motor mount that you saw previously. The spaceship has a hole in the middle where the lead screw is inserted, allowing all of our vertical motion to be on one axis. This is a unique aspect of our design and it allowed us to conserve space. With previous iterations of the spaceship, we ran into issues where the lead nut would only move down. After some discussion, we determined it was because nothing was holding the spaceship in place to prevent rotation. As such, we added the guides and guide rails to fix this issue. To ensure we do not eject the tips when dispensing fluid, we implemented a lead switch towards the bottom of the design. Due to the structure of the spaceship, a limit switch was not needed at the top of the design because the lead screw would bottom out on the spaceship when reaching maximum height. Our fluid dispensary subsystem has three main components, a 3.5 millimeter inner diameter nozzle, a 3.3 millimeter diameter plunger, and a five millimeter outer diameter, one millimeter thick O-ring. On the left, you can see a cross section of the subsystem. A zoomed in image showcasing the O-ring groove is shown on the right. The plunger is directly attached to the spaceship by threading it into a heat insert within the spaceship. We calculated the necessary depth and width of the O-ring groove to ensure a proper seal based on our chosen O-ring. The O-ring visibly overlaps on both the nozzle and plunger on the zoomed in image on the right. This represents the compression of the O-ring giving us an effective dynamic seal for fluid management. Moving on from our liquid handling subsystem, we're going to look into our ejector mechanism. Starting on the left side of the screen at the top, we have our internal ejector plate. And this internal ejector plate directly interfaces with the bottom of the spaceship. So when it's engaged, it'll compress our precision compression springs against the bottom of the motor mount. While running through tests, we had some trouble figuring out how to interface from the internal part of our design 
to the external part of the design to eject the tip. And our team decided on two threaded standoffs that actually create a more slender look to our design. Connecting to this threaded standoffs are the tip ejector plate, which can be seen in a close-up view on the right side. The cool part about this design is the center notch. And this allows us to dispense the maximum amount of fluid, which as Drew mentioned earlier was 200 microliters without ejecting the tip until necessary. Here on the right is a video that we put together of our ejector mechanism working. Those have sound, so uh, if your headphones are turned up really loud, just be careful. Moving on from our ejector mechanism, we actually had a failure that occurred between our nozzle and threads. As you can see in the top right corner, a uh, failure was induced by the area reduction occurred in our design uh, sequence. So initially we're designed with two O-ring glands and five threads of engagement. However, this caused no clearance between the threads and the gland, which meant that the wall thickness at that point was super thin. And so that actually caused it to fail in shear when we were threading our nozzle into our base plate. So to mitigate that failure, as can be seen by the green uh, checked uh, figure in the bottom right corner, uh, we reduced the threads of engagement and it only included one O-ring gland. This actually simplified the design and made it easier for us to put the O-ring into, into the nozzle. Also during testing, we needed to increase the length of the nozzle to make sure we can suck up the maximum amount of fluid necessary. So in order to um, intake the maximum amount of fluid that like Jerry was just saying, we have to have the proper size um, plunger and have to make sure that it moves the um, proper amount in height as well. Since we had a three point, <clears throat> excuse me, since we had a 3.17 millimeter diameter plunger, it was calculated that we need a 25.3 millimeter height change in order to intake the maximum volume of 200 microliters. Now the next calculation we need to get this volume is to determine the number of degrees that the motor needs to rotate. We use the spec sheet from the motor to determine that each degree of rotation intakes 0 0.206 microliters of liquid. Then we solve um, or determine that 45.45 degrees of rotation um, is what we need for each millimeter of height change. And then we use uh, the equations below that to find our total motor rotation. The height was just a simple volume desired over cross-sectional area of the plunger then that was input and multiplied by a constant um, in units of degrees per millimeter to calculate the total degrees of motor rotation needed. Now this calculation is only theoretical and gives us the theoretical number of degrees needed for an input volume desired, um, but it's not always exact due to different factors. And Mike is about to talk in the next slide about how we um, correct this number using a calibration curve. All right, so if you start with the table on the top on the left hand side, uh, we started off with five different target volumes that we wanted to test out. Uh, we were trying to see about the calibration curve and its linearity and by doing five different tests spread out, uh, we were able to do that successfully. Uh, so we first started off using the equations Paul just discussed to determine the motor rotations you see there on the right hand side. Um, then those were plotted um, in a calibration curve and we determined an equation for that line as seen in the top right hand corner of the plot. Um, so the way this works is basically we would pick a desired volume, plug it in for X, um, and then the Y value we solved for would be the degrees that we would enter into the Arduino program. Uh, we did, like I said, we did our five different target volumes and for each we did five different tests. Um, and it is important to note that our standard deviation was the highest at 0.936, uh, which is still in the customer needs requirement of plus or minus one microliter. And then by doing these tests and seeing these standard deviations, we were able to therefore confirm our calibration curve and use that moving forward.
All right, so before we get to the video on the right, which showcases our final design, uh, just a little bit about the procedure, about how we went on to test each case. Uh, so first we started out with the graduated cylinder, uh, put it on the mass balance and hit the zero button. Uh, we determined the desired volume we wanted to reach, uh, went back to that calibration curve I just discussed, uh, found out what degrees um, our volume corresponds to, put that into Arduino, allowed the pipe header to run through the process, dispense the water back into that graduated cylinder, and then we were able to weigh and record the volume. Um, and this process was repeated for all the test cases. Uh, like I said, the video on the right goes through these steps basically. Um, and also um, it is important to note that we do not have the final motor housing on top of our design, uh, just so we can allow everyone to see the internal components move and how they work. All right, again, thank you guys for taking time out of your day to come watch our presentation. At this point, we'll be taking any questions you guys have for us. Okay, great, thanks for your presentation. Um, any questions from our panelists? Our panelists have been very quiet today. Huh. Well, um, so the fascinating part about um, your experience that you shared in the presentation was was that um, that failure, right? The the thread basically breaking off, mm -hmm. um, and I, my well, he wasn't my PhD advisor, but he was a member of my doctoral committee. Um, uh, Peter Griffiths uh, at MIT used to say that the reason that we run experiments is to be reminded of what we forgot. Um, so you guys sort of had that that experience. So um, so can you walk me through you know sort of how that happened? Um, you guys started out with with two O rings in there, and you eventually moved to one O ring. So so right. why the two O rings and then the one O ring and who was it that actually did the 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 <laughs> twisting and realized, oops. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I guess yeah. I'll take that one. Okay. I'm the one that broke it. <laughs> um, so uh, as you can see here, I feel like this was the typical, you know, you get caught up in all the solid works. You don't really realize how thin that wall is when you're working with, you know, a three millimeter diameter uh, of the pipe there. And so <laughs> when I was putting it into the base plate, which at the time was not just a thread insert, it was an aluminum plate. So another iteration we made because we realized that was very heavy and wasteful. Um, I was threading it into the bottom and it became stuck, which we don't know if it was because maybe there's a little nick in the thread, but it became stuck. So I went and grabbed a wrench. <laughs> I twisted it a little more. And as, as soon as I know it, it just crumbled right off. And <laughs> as you can see the failure, uh, in the top right there. So it all came down to, I would say probably the difficulty in the manufacturing was also really hard as on the lathe these were pretty much blind uh glands that you had to put in there uh, Noel, Noel was the one to make it so he can probably tell you how difficult it was and yeah well, sir, not to interrupt you but that was my next mm -hmm. question is how, how did you do that I, mm -hmm. some sort of like micro boring bar yeah, yeah. so for, for that <laughs> one uh, we had to custom order a new boring tool because we have such a small diameter for the groove and the width that we had to get our own boring tool to utilize. And even then, like Andrew kind of mentioned, it was a blind insert into the lathe. 
So they were just going based on the accuracy of the lathe and hoping that they were in the right location. So there also could have been a chance that maybe they were too close to the threads as well, or maybe that mm -hmm. uh, the tool could also only go down a certain depth and they were limited by that. But the biggest concern is that we had to order that custom tool that since we didn't have anything in the lab that could work. Yeah. yeah and then yeah, along the way, we also realized that we had way too many threads just, you know, just to hold it in place. So. And you guys went from, from two O rings to one O ring. Yep. Right. Uh, I can talk a little bit about that. So on the original one, we did have two O ring glands machined in there. However, um, at the beginning, it was really difficult to get the O-ring in there. We actually figured out a pretty easy way to go about it. So we only got one O-ring in there and we we're like, all right, let's just test it, see if it works. Uh, we went through the testing um, probably about midway through the semester and figured out that one O-ring, uh, if it, it was lubricated, could suffice as uh, you know having the suction needed. So we just went ahead and scrapped the second O-ring um, for A, ease of manufacturing, and then B, ease of assembly, <laughs> just to get one O-ring in there. Great. Okay. Yeah. No, this is, you know, I'm sure at the time it was like, Oh no. Right. Like, uh, what have I done? And then you yeah. had to, mm -hmm. you know, somehow fight this little now orphan thread tip out of whatever part that it was buried in, which I'm sure wasn't fun either, but um, you know, ultimately better for this to happen now, right. In the four five Oh two lab uh, in the context of prototyping, then in, um, you know, Professor Menezes's lab when he's in the midst of, I don't know, pipetting, you know, biohazard seven into biohazard <laughs> eight. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you guys discovered this and, and fixed it. So um, that's a, a great, you know, sort of real world. You know, I, I always talk in 4501 about war stories, and th this is a great war story to, to be able to tell um, about, you know, <laughs> the time you you made the wall way too thin and broke your pipette off in the uh in the holder so um okay um well i don't want to dominate the question so if, if there's uh, any questions from our from our panel um it looks like only rick is online yeah rick i hate to single you out but <laughs> you could catch him snoozing <laughs> yeah oh. so dr trom i'm in the middle of proctoring an exam so that that's why oh, i have wow. to speak so uh, my, my my apologies I, I am listening and making comments but i i i just don't have the opportunity to actually uh ask questions directly to them so my apologies oh no that's fair uh okay if there's anything you want you can put it in the chat and we can uh we can just respond that way if you yeah, like. Yeah, unfortunately uh i'm i'm uh attending via my phone and it doesn't oh, have okay. the chat option uh, <laughs> thank you for listening though appreciate mm -hmm. it yeah no good presentation guys thank you, uh, thank I, you. I enjoyed uh the failure stuff's always a, a good learning experience mm -hmm. yeah so the other thing that i wanted to ask if it's if, if if i get to be the panel um is you guys um you had that that table um of uh experimental data uh, yeah there we go um and you guys are talking about standard deviations so Okay, I didn't look carefully enough at this. Okay, so there's um, five tests at each one of these preset volumes, and then you measured the volume. Um, and, well, you did it gravimetrically, right? You weren't actually measuring volume, you were measuring mass. Yep. Um, and then presumably we know the density of water at whatever temperature the room happened to be at. And so that that's how you got the volume. Um, how how comfortable are you with taking standard deviations of, of only five test points? So originally we were doing 10 test points and originally our plan was actually to test in 10 microliter increments. So 10, 20, all the way to 200, but we were actually having trouble, you know, linking up with our, our um, test system in the lab um, over an extended period of time. So to reduce the amount of time it took to test, we cut it down to five tests, which we thought was sufficient especially due to the fact that we we're reaching this kind of precision five tests in a row. So that kind of validated our assumption to move it down to five tests. Yeah, this is, this is a, um, 
I hate to say it, but sort of a, a UF thing. So, so uh, Dr. Ridgeway, Shannon Ridgeway has got um, his standard deviation equation, which I think you guys use in mom lab, which I've never seen anywhere else. And I keep asking him like, like, where does this come from? And he pointed to some obscure textbook that no one's ever been able to find, but um, yeah, it's um, so, so, okay. You, you guys, I think, I think, you know, appreciate that um, you're really supposed to do um the magic number is 11. Uh, so it's, it's 10 plus one, uh, which is 11 tests, um, repeated tests to, to, to develop a, a true standard deviation. Um, and, and I always just use 12 because, you know, you never know, you, you could get an outlier, um, right. yeah. that, that you have to like throw out. Like, so for example, if I'm looking at, um, you know, the, the 10 microliter, um, you've got this 10.5, right. Which sort of, sticks out a little bit and might, might actually be an outlier if you applied um i'm trying to remember the name of the test there's a test that you can use to throw out outliers um so yeah 12 is the magic number but then of course um you know as we always talk about like when i teach fluids which doesn't happen very often but when i teach fluids um we always talk about um there's a trade-off right between um the amount of time and resources that you're investing versus the precision of your measurement. Um, and so it sounds like you guys encountered that head on um, in that um, to carry out the test matrix that you had originally envisioned would have taken, you know, countless hours of your time. And then, and then was it really, you know, worth it because you've got what looks to be, I, I don't see an R squared value on here, but this, line is basically like i mean it fits the data points almost perfectly right so yeah um you, you sort of get to a point where you're like okay do we really need to run any more tests to validate and eh, no probably not um so okay yeah and we also wanted to, to accommodate all the other pipette groups because there there is a fair bit of them so we, we didn't want to like hog the test stand too yeah th this is that last minute like you know, last week or two of the class, everybody's using yeah. the same apparatus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah no, Unfortunately, that's... the day we wanted to go in and test, uh, it got broke the night before. So that definitely threw us off by a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 No, the good news is it came out as almost a perfect line here. So, um, I, yeah, I think I think you're good with the combination of um the multiple volumes and then running the test five times and then fitting the line to it. It's um, if you added an R squared value, um, that would be the last thing that I'd want to see to just sort of confirm, right. um, you know, absolutely yeah. that it's, it follows that line. Um, okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll be sure to put that in our final report. We can just add that in there. Yeah. Yeah. Excel will do that for you. Yep. Um, I used to make my fluid students calculate it, but Excel is, gotten smarter over the years so <laughs> very good okay well i think um we're probably good to wrap up there uh, we do have a a 15 minute break built into the schedule um now for everybody to to you know get get coffee and um you know sort of decompress for 15 minutes before we do the next one so i just want to thank you guys one more time for uh, all your your hard work this semester and sharing your design with us and uh, it, it came out really well uh, this is you know a beautiful perfect linear fit and uh, gives us a lot of confidence that we'll be able to take uh, this design and move it over to professor menezes's lab and, and actually get some uh, um, you know real biomechanical uh, biomedical type work done uh, with with the design you guys have come up with so we appreciate it and thank you for your time, you. too. Uh, yeah, we thank appreciate you very it. Much. And thank for you so input. much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. We'll stop recording.